This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman with Aaron Maté. We turn now to a historic milestone for justice in Africa. The former dictator of Chad, Hussein Habre, has been detained in Senegal, where he's, been li where he's lived in exile since being ousted in 1990. Known as Africa's Pinochet, Habre is expected to face charges of crimes against humanity and war crimes for systematic torture and the killings of tens of thousands of opponents during his eight years in power. If the case proceeds, he will eventually stand trial in a special court established in Senegal after a 22-year campaign led by his victims. Habre would be the first first African leader to be tried for atrocities in Africa instead of in an, in an international tribunal. Habre came to power with the help of the Reagan administration in 1982. The U.S. provided Habre with millions of dollars in annual military aid and trained a secret police known as the DDS. It's believed some 40,000 people died under his rule. Clement Ibofuta is one of the key witnesses for the prosecution and president of the Chadian Victims Association. In this clip from Human Rights Watch, he shows the field where he was forced to bury more than a thousand people over the course of four years. And right now we are coming to the common grave, and from here on it is just corpses. From the common grave to wait at the back it's just all corpses every day. It was seven, eight, ten, twenty, thirty, forty, yeah, every day. Since Habre's fall from power in 1990, Clement Abifuta and other victims have waged a tireless campaign to bring Habre to trial. But justice has long been elusive. Habre was placed under house arrest in 2000, but his case lagged for over a decade until now. Well, for more, we're joined by someone who's played a key role in the effort to bring Hussein Habre to justice. Reed Brody, counsel and spokesperson for Human Rights Watch in Brussels. He's worked with Hussein Habre's victims since 1999. His lead counsel in their case talk about the latest developments of him being brought into detention in Senegal, Reid. Thank you. Well, as you said, it's been 22 years. Um, uh, finally, last year, there were two breakthroughs in this case. First was the election of Macky Sall as president of Senegal, and uh, the victims had been lobbying Macky Sall for many years. Uh, and when he uh, came into office, he said that he was going to uh, finally uh, allow this trial to go forward. And second, there was a, a decision by the International Court of Justice in The Hague. Uh, that ordered Senegal um, to prosecute Habre without further delay if it did not extradite him. And Senegal and the African Union came together and created this special court within the, the uh, courts of Senegal uh, to try crimes committed in Chad during Habre's period. And the prosecutor has just come back from a trip to, to Chad. Um, he has all the dossiers that we had put together, that the Belgians had put together over several years. And finally now, um, he's going to ask for his and Habre's indictment on charges of crimes against humanity and war crimes. I want to turn to an excerpt of The Dictator Hunter, a film about Reed Brody's work. In this clip, uh, he's given a tour of one of Hissène Habre's notorious prisons. Once this used to be a swimming pool, reserved for the families of the French military. Later on, Hassan Abre turned the pool into a jail, a unique prison. I was tortured. They tied my arms behind my back. To stop the blood circulating and to paralyze one's arms and legs to make people lose their limbs. In this cell, for example, there were 30 people. All cells were full. There was no oxygen. People died of lack of oxygen. It is a very cruel way to torture someone. Every morning, we would knock on the walls like this. The people in the cell next to ours would do the same, to show us they were still alive. If someone died, we would ask them to take away the corpse. They would say, how many are there? If we said two or three, they told us to wait till there were five. For those who suffered most, we would lay on the corpses, as they were a little cooler. We slept on them till they were taken away. That's Ismail Hashim from the film The Dictator Hunter. Uh, Reid, can you talk to us about the role of 
Peace Sun Harbor's victims in bringing him to justice. Well, what's very interesting about this case uh, is that it's not uh, being driven by The Hague or some international diplomats or prosecutors. This is a case where really the victims are the architects of the effort. And it's been this 22-year campaign um, by people like the people you saw on the screen um, pressing for justice. And, and so it's a very empowering uh, kind of a process. And the victims will actually be parties in the trial. Uh, the victims will have their own legal team. And what we hope is that when this trial is broadcast uh, all over Africa and all back to Chad, and people see the Chadian lawyers, the Chadian victims uh, presenting their testimony, examining witnesses, Chadian lawyer cross-examining Hissen Habre, um, that this, this could be a, an inspiration to people who are looking for justice all around the world. Can you talk about the role of the United States in propping up Hussein Habre for all of the years that he was in power? Sure. The United States saw, uh, Ron, under Ronald Reagan, um, saw uh, Hissen Habre as a bulwark against Muammar Gaddafi. Uh, just as pre Re President Reagan took office, Gaddafi uh, uh, and the then president of Chad, Gukuni Wedi, had signed an agreement to merge. And uh, Chadian, uh, Libyan troops were entering Chad and occupying the north of Chad. And the U.S. saw uh, uh, Chad as the soft underbelly. Of, of the Libyan uh, of the Libyan government and, and uh, Secretary of State Alexander Haig uh, reportedly wanted to aid uh, Hissen Habre, who was then a local warlord, as a way of bloodying Gaddafi's nose. And so the U.S. gave assistance to Habre to help him take power, and then gave military and economic assistance to Habre throughout his government, even as he was turning his country into a police state. And one of the documents. Um, that we recovered in Habre's, uh, many years ago I stumbled on the files of ha Hissen Habre's political police, tens of thousands of documents. Where did you stumble on? Um, in an abandoned building in, in the Chadian capital of Jemena. Um, and we now have all these documents on CD-ROM. We have the lists of names of people who died, of people who were in prisons. And you just but, found these in this abandoned building? Yeah, we were doing a film for a Swiss uh, TV uh, program on uh, the case, and we asked to visit the, uh, the headquarters of his former political police. And there, in room after room, it was like we were finding these documents. And, and one, actually, one of the very first documents we scooped up was a document um, of, uh, in which several of the members of, of the DDS, um, uh, Habre's political police, received training in the United States. And when we cross-checked these names—in fact, I've interviewed a couple of the people—some um, of these were the, uh, the, the most feared torturers in Chad who were receiving training in the U.S. Now, I don't say that they were received training in torture. We have no evidence of that. Um, but the U.S. was intimately involved with Habre's uh, political police. Uh, there was a U.S. advisor um, with Habre's political police. Um, and even to the very last day of Habre's government, the U.S. was giving it military assistance. Uh, Reid, what about the officials in Chad who worked with Habre? Uh, could this case uh, open the way to charges against them? Well, it already has, in fact. I mean, we've been um, hoping that the, that the approach of a trial of Hissen Habre abroad would also change the situation in Chad, because many of these people remain in powerful positions. And, in fact, um, one of them, a, a police chief, um, who is being sued by his victims in Chad, um, tried to assassinate uh, the Chadian lawyer, uh, Jacqueline Mudena, who's leading the case in Chad. He threw, had a grenade thrown at her. And now, just in the last few weeks, actually, the Chadian government, seeing that there was justice being done on the international front, has moved to arrest and has arrested many of Habre's accomplices within Chad. And so when will this trial take place, and where exactly is Hussein Habre right now? Well, he's, he, today he's at a police station um, uh, where he's being held for questioning. Um, President Obama was just in Senegal. Uh, President Obama, actually, and I have to say that the United States has, uh, under President Obama, has been very supportive of uh, this trial. And President Obama, when he met with President Macky Sall, congratulated him on moving forward. And the United States is providing a million dollars, um, together with many other countries, um, for the support of this special court. Uh, we're expecting today or tomorrow the indictment of Hissen Habre on charges of crimes against humanity. Um, then the judges, the investigating judges, will have 15 months 
um, to uh, investigate the charges. And so we're, we're not looking at a trial here for another year and a half um, as these charges are, are, are investigated uh, in Chad. Reed, can you talk about the significance, not only of Hassan Habre being picked up now and going to trial in Senegal, but you also have these other cases that you've been involved with also. You've got Duvalier in Haiti, and you've got Efrain Rios Mont in Guatemala. Well, it's very interesting. I mean, you have three U.S.-backed dictators from the 1980s, all facing charges uh, for crimes against humanity. Uh, Rios Mont in Guatemala, uh, uh, Jean-Claude Duvalier in Haiti. Um, and in each case, really, it's taken, you know, the victims. I mean, the, in Guatemala, I mean, the, the Ishil Maya Indians who have fought for three decades, you know, telling their stories again and again, bringing people up to the grave. Uh, this, in each case, the victims have struggled for, for all this time. In, in Haiti, people like Bobby Duval and Michel Montas, um, you know, who refused to allow fear to dominate. And when, when Duvalier came back into the country, um, you know, they, they filed charges. And, you know, this is a different kind of a justice from The Hague. This is justice at a national level, um, where the victims are the architects of the procedure, um, where the, the, the cases are being played out you know, in front of the Guatemalan people, in front of the Haitian people. In the case of Senegal, of course, it, it, it's the cases happening in, in Senegal. And one of our big challenges for the case of Hissin Habre is to make sure that this trial in Senegal is accessible on TV, uh, makes a difference to people back in Chad. But this is a very positive development for justice at the national level. How will you make the case of Hissin Habre available to people all over the world, the trial of him? Well, the, the budget that we've helped to put together um, includes a mil over a million euros, $1.3 million for outreach activities, for televisions, uh, for um, community meetings, for, for bringing journalists and human rights activists from Chad to Senegal, bringing journalists from Senegal to Chad, because these countries are very far apart and, and, and don't have any direct way, even means of communication. Um, Why is it important to put this uh, trial out to the world? Well, because I think for many reasons. First of all, to we have um, 15 seconds. Sure, to show to show that victims can bring to justice a dictator, and I think that you know this case was inspired by the Pinochet case, uh, and and we hope that this case will inspire many others. Ray Brody, want to thank you very much for being with us, counsel and spokesperson for Human Rights Watch. This is Democracy Now. Democracy Now. 